Hello everybody and welcome to this week's Easy 11 Plus Live lesson in which we're going to be looking at how to start stories. And I've got some new guests on the programme this week, not Dimitri this time because as you might find out, the guests would not necessarily be entirely compatible. I should close a window here, hang on a second. I'm looking at myself talking and I think that's going to be far too, constra far too distracting um, because of, you know, my great beauty. Anyway, talking of great beauty, some other guests this week, cue screams from the audience. We've got these, this lady and gentleman, who surely it's hard to believe are actually the same species. I've been breeding these for a long time, but for some reason I've never actually brought them onto the programme. Perhaps partly because she's really violent and has a tendency to stab me with her spines. Um, anyway, I haven't named these, so I thought one thing I could set as a challenge to my viewers is to come up with some good names for my stick insects. Um, so I'll leave that there as a thought. We'll see how long she can sit there without causing me excessive pain. Um, that's the guy on the back and there she is sitting underneath and they're having a nice conversation. Um, lots of people asking for shout outs, um, but if I do that then everyone will just be asking for them. So you have to give me a really good reason to ask for a shout out. Um, Hello world, says Krista. Another great easy 11 plus live lesson. I should begin with that. Hello world, as I start the lesson. Um, Nadia is screaming. Um, Project Josh is saying, Robert, I don't know how you say so many T's on a name. Which one is a girl or a boy? The big green one is the girl, and the um, uh, small thin one at the back is the boy, believe it or not. Robert Jr., um, that could be a name for him, yeah. Um, Annas did his, um, his or her, sorry, um, easy 11 plus test today and wants a shout out. That's a really good reason for a shout out because you've done a test and you're back watching an easy 11 plus. I find that absolutely incredible. Um, 1962 sus IEQ saw the queen lying in state. Um, you must have queued for a very long time, um, but well done for your dedication. Um, please don't quote song lyrics in the uh, comments. You know who you are because they just take up all the space. It's called spam. Right, I'm going to put the, this lady and gentleman away if I can. I've got to put them in something so that Dimitri doesn't have a little crunchy snack um, while I'm doing the lesson. There we are. And let's go on to talking about some creative writing. So. Here's the worksheet that you will have seen. If you haven't seen the worksheet, then it's linked in the video description down underneath the video on YouTube or above the video on Facebook. Click on the uh, worksheet link there and you can access the worksheet and you can download it, you can print it off, you can draw faces on it, you can do anything you like. Um, and uh, yeah, it's a good way for you to practice what we're doing. And what a lot of people do is they download the worksheet in advance, practice it before the lesson, over the weekend maybe, and then come here with their ideas, ready to compare what they came up with, with what I come up with. If you want to get the worksheets by email, join my mailing list. The easiest way to do that is uh, go to the free resources link in the video description, sign up for the free resources, and that also adds you to my mailing list. You can unsubscribe at any time, but as long as you're on it, that means that you also get the worksheets for the lessons in advanced. Um, <laughs> Skybot Gaming, sorry I joined, what is the insect and is it dead? No, they're very much alive, uh, they were just a little bit unnerved by being on YouTube, which meant they stayed rather still, um, just dazzled by the stardom and by their adoring fans. Uh, what are they? Uh, they're commonly known as jungle nymph stick insects, um, or Heteropteryx dilatata if you want the uh, scientific name, and um, the females of that are, you know, by some metrics, uh, the biggest insects in the world. Um, so yeah, interesting creatures, I think. Um, okay, shout out to everybody who's in the exams. Uh, Namitha, what language are you talking in? Uh, someone the other day wrote a comment saying they thought I was Australian, which I thought was um, interesting. Um, I believe I'm talking to you in English, but maybe uh, I've had some strange neurological incident and I'm actually babbling at you in some other language. Right, let's get on with this and let's do some writing. So, the point of the task here is to think about the very beginning of a piece of creative writing. I've got the task set up here um, and you see you just need to write the first one to three sentences of each thing. In fact, oh, it says that here. So, for each of the following tasks, provide three possible openings, okay? So we got one, two, and three, and we got two tasks. Um, different from one another and as effective as you can make them, you do not need to complete a paragraph. The first one to three sentences are all that is needed. So even just one really good sentence is enough. The point about this is to practice how you get into the story, how you launch something in a way that interests the reader from the beginning, develops a bit of character, and sets up some ideas that you can then develop in the rest of your writing. 
Um, because a lot of people, you know, we talk about planning, we talk about description and so on, but getting off to a really punchy start is really important and makes a huge difference to what comes afterwards. I've covered this before with longer beginnings. This time we're just looking at the very, very, very opening. Okay, a story set in a dental clinic. So I've come up with a few ideas here and let's see what I can make of them. So from the point of view of the patient. So I imagine myself as the patient and I want to get right into the heart of things. So what's gonna be most dramatic here might be some kind of quite, you know, radical procedure on my mouth. Maybe I'm a bit nervous about it. That's an interesting emotional setup. And what could be more punchy than getting into the moment just before the procedure begins? So I'm lying there, I'm lying back on the dentist's chair, and I'm looking up, what do I see? And I think what I see, I'm imagining, I'm looking up now past my monitor. What have I got there? I've got a big, bright ring light that's quite hard to look at. Um, and, oh, I haven't turned on my side light. Ta-da! Um, that's a bit better. Um, and I look up and I just see this dazzling light shining down upon me, under which the dentist is going to be doing their work. And what am I going to feel about this light? Well, this big round thing, it's like it's staring at me. Um, it's, um, yes, yeah, what would I do if I was looking at a dazzling light? I'd probably shut my eyes pretty quickly. Um, but what do I see before I shut my eyes or just afterwards? Let's go with that. Okay, so let's punch right in. One, let's push that down a bit, okay. One great eye, okay. So I'm not starting with sort of correct grammar that would say there is a great eye. I'm just punching in one great eye. What's it doing? It's staring down. Staring, staring is a bit obvious. Um, if I feel it's a bit sinister, how could I change that verb? How about leering down at me? Leering down at me. So I'm always thinking about how to, in particular, how to make my verbs as engaging as possible. And if I'm trying to personify this light by describing it like an eye, then let's make, let's give it as much personality as possible with the verb leering. Leering down at me, what's it doing? It's so intense. So with intensity, no, with such intensity, intensity that I screw my eyes shut. Yeah, I screw my eyes shut. Okay. So leering down at me with such intensity that I screw my eyes shut. I could put a full stop there. Or, 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 I could describe what I see just before I shut my eyes because that will be something that kind of lives in my memory. See how I'm really acting this. This is the thought process I go thought, thought thought process I go through if I'm actually trying to write something creative, not just for a lesson. I'm putting myself into the situation and trying to bring it to life as much as I possibly can. Um, always thinking how to make it more interesting, how to make it more emotional without saying it was scary and trying to bring that emotion out in the reader instead. Um, so, that I screw my eyes shut, but I see something first. So, but not quickly enough, um, but not so quickly that, and I'm setting up to describe what I see. So what am I gonna see just before I shut my eye? If I'm about to have a dental operation, so I never lose track of the scenario, what, what is a scary thing that I might see? A dentist drill. Not so quickly that, that I don't see the drill. Okay, um, what's the drill doing? I don't see the drill pass in front of it. Now, often I'd be in favor of relatively short sentences, but I think this is kind of knitting everything together and it's not a massive sentence by any means, pass in front of it. Yeah, yes, pass in front of it because I'm conveying movement. Pass in front of it. Um, and what does it, what's gonna happen? The drill is going to be lowered towards my face. So how do I see that something is coming from close to even closer. Try that with your finger, what do you see? It gets larger and as it gets to about there, it starts to get fuzzy and split into two because I can't focus anymore. So let's describe that. And there's nothing to stop you, even in an exam hall, looking up and doing that with your finger. As long as you don't make distracting noises or do crazy stuff um, that's really gonna be off-putting for people, this is fine. It's all putting yourself into the moment and a bit of acting uh, will really help you to write better. Uh, so, not so quickly that I don't see, see the drill pass in front of it, growing larger, let's be more specific, it's a narrow thing, going a lot, growing longer, and, um, and then fuzzy? 
Yeah, and then, well, I shut my eyes almost straight afterwards, so then briefly fuzzy, and then briefly fuzzy as it, as it comes towards my face, as it nears my face, and and how can I say that it stops being clear and loses focus and slips from focus? Okay, but there's one thing about this drill I haven't really covered. This is all very visual, but what's the really notable thing about a dentist drill? What would you imagine? You'd imagine how it looks as it approaches you, but you'd also, I'm sure, think of its bzz, bzz, buzzing sound. Briefly fuzzy as it buzzes towards my face. and slips from focus. Now this is just one sentence, but I think this is all that I need to fulfill the requirements of this task. It says first one to three sentences and just get the story off to a really punchy start. One great eye leering down at me with such intensity that I screw my eyes shut, but not so quickly that I don't see the drill pass in front of it, growing longer and then briefly fuzzy as it buzzes towards my face and slips from focus. And we know what happens next, the, the eyes shut because this is all happening in between the light being dazzling and your eyes shutting. So this is all happening really quickly, but described in this kind of detail that almost gives a sense of time standing still as you await the horror of the dentist's intervention. Bum, bum, bum. Apologies to anyone here whose who's parent or parents is or are dentists. Um, of course, dentists are actually lovely. Some of my friends are dentists, but we all know that they're really malicious torturers, of course. Um, malicious, that's a word that people are always using in stories and always using wrong. Uh, do check what it means so you use it correctly. I keep coming across people using malicious incorrectly. I'm not quite sure why that particular word, but people seem to like it, but not like looking it up. Right, on to the second one. So what can we do here? So it's really good to get into the heart of things. Let's try that again. So we're getting into the heart of things. Where else could we get into the heart of things? We could have the moment when you wake up. We could have when you arrive at the dentist, we could have when you leave the dentist, or how about we take what we did but go even further into it. So rather than just before the thing starts, why don't we go in absolutely at the crucial moment when the really painful thing happens? Ha <laughs> ha. Okay. What would be the most classically unpleasant thing that might be done to you at a dentist. Okay, lots of things. Um, we've covered one there, which is some kind of drilling. Um, maybe part of the same procedure, but let's go for having having a tooth pulled. It's a good classical one. Um, people have been writing about teeth being pulled from since long before modern dentistry. Let's go with that. At the very key moment of your tooth being pulled, what would you feel? Well, you'll feel it being pulled. And what's your response going to be as at the moment when that thing is <gasps> yanked out? I just did it. I reckon a sudden intake of breath would be a virtually universal response to that happening. It's something that's so instinctive you couldn't fight it. Someone says wisdom teeth removed. That's a great one, except that having your wisdom teeth removed will al almost always, I think, happen under general anaesthetic, so when you're asleep. I could be wrong about that, but in my experience, I think that's how it's normally done. Uh, Soma Robert says, you can write when you wake up and find immense pain in your mouth. Yes, that would be another really good one. Um, let's go with this, though, because we're there. So, um, I gasped. Okay, let's be very clear to the, this is the start of the story, so we need to give a bit of context so the reader knows what they're reading about. I gasped as I felt, as I felt the pain. Let's hold that back. Sometimes the pain comes a fraction behind the unpleasant experience. What do you actually feel in the moment? You're gonna feel an enormous pulling at your mouth. I've never had this done to me, so I'm not making this all up. It might be complete nonsense, by the way. Anyone who's had experience of a tooth being pulled under local anesthetic or who, um, um, or who is a dentist, I apologize if this is all um, dental gobbledygook. I'm doing my best, I'm imagining it. I gasped as I felt the tug, okay. Now that, my friends, should be a short sentence in my opinion, because a tug is a short, sharp thing. So let's keep our writing short and sharp. I gasped as I felt the tug. Vitali in the comments says, I had two teeth ripped out. Ouch, tell us how it felt. Um, tell me whether I'm writing about this in a way that makes sense to you, that you can recognize. I gasped as I felt the tug. Okay, we could write about the pain. 
Let's hold back the pain. Because, why am I holding back the pain? Because I'm so nice. No, it's because the one thing the reader is rated, waiting for is the pain. And so we can keep them interested by keeping them waiting for that pain. They're expecting the pain, don't give it to them. Okay, I gasped as I felt the tug. Tug T comes out. Let's think about physics. If you tug something, right, imagine, here's a pen. I'm tugging on the end, okay? What's gonna happen to this hand when this hand finishes tugging and slips off the end of the pen? Okay, it jerks back the other way because there's a sudden release. That, imagine that's my lower jaw. <laughs> it comes out and my jaw pulls back the other way. At least in my imagination, that's what's gonna happen. I gasped as I felt the tug and rather than saying suddenly the tooth came out, let's say then suddenly my jaw, what did it do? It, I'm typing off to the side here, um, suddenly my jaw fell away. It didn't fall off your face, so let's qualify it. Fell away from the force. So imagining the sense of force suddenly vanishing. And maybe in that moment you're thinking, have they got the tooth? Or did they, did it just slip? What's happened? <gasps> What's happening to me? Will I be hideous for life? Well, you know, sometimes you're just born that way. Um, suddenly my jaw fell away from the force. Um, and I felt the pain. No, keep them waiting for the pain. And keep the character waiting for the pain. What would you do in a moment when you're convinced you're about to feel great pain? Imagine that maybe you've been unlucky enough to um, break, a, break an ankle or something. And in that moment, there's often a moment before you feel the pain, when you scream or something anyway, because you actually make, give the reaction before you feel the pain, because you're so primed to do it. But in this case, you're there, you've got stuck, you've got okay, clamping your mouth, you've got padding in your mouth, you can't even scream. So what kind of noise are you gonna make? And, like, uh, uh. and I, I whimpered. I whimpered in, in anticipation. Yeah, anticipation. Anticipation of what? Of the pain. And I whimpered in anticipation of the pain. Okay. Now we kept them waiting for the pain. What would be an interesting twist now? Twist, that's an unfortunate choice of word. How about if there isn't any pain? Because actually the anaesthetic, contrary to all your skeptical expectations, works. But the pain never came. Now I often tell people not to repeat words, and here I've repeated the word pain. But I think the repetition of the word pain here reflects the way that the character is thinking, pain, 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 I'm going to feel the worst pain in my life. Where's the pain? And this, I think, is also an interesting omen to a story, if I say so myself. I gasped as I felt the tug. Then suddenly my jaw fell away from the force and I whimpered in anticipation of the pain. But the pain never came. What happened next? And if the reader is thinking, hmm, what happens next? Then that's an effective start to a story. These are pretty ordinary experiences. Most people will have some kind of dental intervention in their lives. If you want to avoid it, look after your teeth. Um, and, um, but we can still bring drama to them. Kind of ordinary, I wouldn't say everyday drama, but familiar drama. Okay, um, we're going through a good rate here. This is good. Um, what's going on in the comments? Uh, gold tooth. Have you got a gold tooth? Fantastic. Dramatic. Um, Bond villain level. Um, it's Noel says, I clutched onto the armrest. Yeah, I like that. I whimpered in anticipation of the pain. Um, I, I, I'm, I could add clutching the armrest. I kind of like the simplicity of what there is already. Not clustering this with too much detail. Just keeping everything focused on the mouth and your feelings about the mouth, as though you've forgotten the room. So for that reason, I think I'm gonna choose not to mention the armrest, but it would also be a very good detail, and it would certainly get a big tick if you put it in your version. Um, Funny Bunny says, but it never happened, I was shocked. 
but it never happened. Yeah, that's kind of what I've done. I was shocked. I would not choose to write that. You got any idea why I wouldn't choose to write that? A simple reason, really. I want to show my shock rather than telling the reader, because I want the reader to work out the shock for themselves. And if I tell them to feel shocked, they're actually less likely to feel it. That's the kind of perverse way that readers think. Uh, if you've ever read anything, you have been that person. I feel that here, this very short sentence, but the pain never came, shows the character's shock more effectively than I say, than if I said, which was shocking. That's my opinion. Um, I came to the sudden realization of two new black holes in my mouth. Careful. How would you know that they were black unless you could see them? Um, so you're losing the character's perspective. I gasped, sucking in a drop of blood as a sharp tug snapped the root of my molar from Fazana. I, that, I really like that, actually. Um, snapped the root of my molar. Oof. Yeah, that's great. Sucking in a drop of blood. That's really, really good detail. Um, yeah. Now, you've got your kind of mouth clamped. So maybe I'd say something like feeling blood tickle at the back of my throat rather than saying sucking in a drop of blood because I don't think you'd be in so much control of it as to know whether it was a drop or lots of drops. Um, but it's great. Uh, I'm just playing with the idea and thinking what I might do with it. Uh, again, people who are saying they were shocked and scared in the comments tried to show that rather than telling it. Um, Mr. Ketab, are short sentences more effective most of the time? Really good question. There is no easy answer to that. Um, you need the right length of sentence to convey whatever it is that you're describing at the time, and that will depend on what you're describing. However, you should default to shorter sentences generally, not because then they are per se necessarily more effective, but because they're clearer. And you want to start by writing clearly and then add complexity if that is necessary. So write simple sentences and relatively short and uncomplicated sentences, except when there is a reason not to. And that I would agree with. Um, as for whether a really short sentence is more effective, well, if all you wrote was really short sentences, that would sound just as weird as if you, if you only wrote really long sentences. So your sort of average sentence is maybe going to be in between the two, whatever that means. Um, just try to make your sentence length match what you're trying to describe rather than always thinking they have to be short or they have to be long. Okay, on to the next. Uh, wonderful comments, by the way. I really appreciate them. Really good contributions. Anyone who's watching who isn't participating in the live chat and wonders why they can't, the live chat is for subscribers. Uh, if you want to subscribe, just click subscribe under the video. It's completely free. And um, that way you can join the live chat. Um, Okay. Also, I love subscribers. They help the channel. Yes, it is a little bit of a bribe limiting the chat to subscribers to encourage people to subscribe because that helps out the channel. I'm not ashamed to say that and I hope uh, you don't find that reprehensible. It's very easy to subscribe. You just click the button. Right. Um, number three. I'm going to do something different here. Um, let's do the thing that a lot of people would do, which is arriving at the dentist's. Now, this would often be a boring approach. I went in, I sat down, I said hello to the receptionist, and you're just delaying writing about the interesting stuff. So let's describe arriving there, but try to make it have some value. Um, so I'm not going to say I walked into the dentist, but what's one of the first things you see? How about the dentist? And how about if the way you perceive the dentist isn't quite the way that most people would expect? And I think with dentist stories, we've already got used to the idea that being at the dentist is horrible, the dentists are ghastly people and so on. So let's go against that. And let's go with something really simple, unexpectedly uncreative, and then do something with it. He was a good dentist. How's that? Okay. But you've just arrived. How do you know that he is a good dentist? So... Let's see what we can do with it. Um, he was a good dentist. Um, yeah, I knew that. And so that begs the reader to ask, but how did you know that? So how did I know that? Let's come up with a really, really stupid reason to know that. You know when you sometimes just get a really good instinct about somebody and there is no good reason for it. You just feel positive about them and you can't justify it. Let's go with that a bit. Because then the reader's going to be thinking, but have you got it wrong? Are they actually a good dentist? Are they going to, you know, knock your teeth out by accident and forget to apply anaesthetic and such like? 
I knew that somehow. So the, the narrator's admitting that they um, really aren't sure why this is. They just know it. I knew that somehow as... As soon as I saw what? What could be sort of vaguely sort of, you know, offbeat here? Let's imagine that this dentist has a really big belly and we see that first. Because that maybe makes them seem kind of sort of cosy and approachable somehow. As soon as I saw um, his, his paunch, because that's a word for a big belly. As soon as I saw his paunch, um, okay, so you go with stereotypes, wobble, but how about if it's, imagine it kind of, sort of, it's quite tight, it sort of sways. So, so as soon as I saw his, saw his paunch, swaying out ahead of him, swaying out ahead of him, into the waiting room. So as he comes slowly out of his office or around the corner or something like that back from the loo the first thing you see of him is his belly coming around the corner and somehow to this person because of some association they have in their mind who knows that's comforting and makes them think this is a good dentist and you as a reader think why would you think that what's this got to do with anything who knows but it takes us into the character the fact that they think this slightly offbeat thing brings characterization this man, this man would not hurt me, would not hurt me, I was, scroll down a bit, I was sure of it. Yeah, and that's an interesting beginning, I think, because it establishes the character in an interesting way, that they have this slightly strange way of looking at people. It makes the dentist initially seem kind of comical, which actually gives us room to interest the reader by showing the ways in which he's not just a comical character. And it has this assertion, this man would not hurt me, I was sure of it, that is then crying out to the reader, for the reader to say, no, be careful, you don't know that. He might be a supervillain. And so we wonder. Attentive students of my writing videos might wonder about the punctuation of this sentence. Because if we were going to be very strict about it, it should perhaps be a full stop. This man would not hurt me. New sentence, I was sure of it. But I want these thoughts to kind of flow together. This man would not hurt me. I was sure of it. So it has that kind of slight... It sounds slightly dubious precisely because it's so confidently strung together. And we go, no, you can't be sure of that. So that's a comma of choice that grammatically you could argue is slightly unorthodox, but I think it works better for what I'm trying to convey. The important thing about punctuation is that you're always thinking about it and you always punctuate consciously and conscient conscientious conscientiously for a reason. He was a good dentist. I knew that somehow as soon as I saw his paunch swaying out ahead of him into the waiting room. This man would not hurt me. I was sure of it. <gasps> be careful. Okay, so here we've got three very different, I think, approaches to this task. Some interesting short openings, each of which sets up an effective story. Right, let's look at the comments and then let's move on. Um, the first version reminds me of the book Demon Dentist by David Walliams. Fantastic. I haven't read it, but um, I have read some David Walliams and I can well imagine it, actually. I think that is kind of the mood that I was aiming for. So um, thank you. I'm pleased about that. And David Walliams is a good writer. Um, uh, funny Bunny, a really nice one. It needs a bit of punctuating and a grammar check, but I like the ideas. He was a good dentist. I meet him a lot. Um, I met him a lot, I think. Yet I was still scared. He gave me a tingly feeling in my tummy. I kept on saying to myself, he won't hurt me. It's all going to be okay. Yeah, sort out the punctuation there and a bit of the grammar, and that would be a really, really good opening. Um, I like that very much. Nadia, this is a really good one. One second, one second, one second, I thought, as I stared at the clock, waiting for, the, waiting for my name to be called. It's like the charge of the laugh, light brigade. Half a league, half a league, half a league onwards into the valley of death and so on. Um, Eishmiken, 
Thank you, Robert. My results have come for the 11 plus and I've been selected to the second exam. Woo! That is fantastic. Congratulations. I don't have the confetti on this screen. Maybe I've got, maybe I can do it on the main page. If I, yeah, I've got some confetti here. There you are. Here is some confetti for you. Um, oh, it's got stuck. No, it's coming. Um, congratulations. Absolutely fantastic. I'm glad that went so well for you. And it really pleases me when people uh, come back and tell me about the things they've achieved uh, through these lessons. So uh, great stuff. Thank you for telling me. Right, back to the task. That was just a brief confetti detour. Um, okay, there were loads of wonderful ideas here, um, but let's carry on with the task so we don't get stuck for too long. By the way, don't worry. Um, if we um, find ourselves running out of time, um, I'll just... Um, uh, I just won't do all of these. That's okay. Um, right, the second one. Think about what I was aiming for here. Um, yeah, there were more wonderful ones coming in. The clock was bewitched. It seemed to be 10 times slower. Um, uh, Hannah is posting um, um, her suggestion again. I've already commented on it. Um, his jovial expression and welcoming arms made all my apprehension waft away. Great. Lovely. Um, what are good tips for entrance exams in a week? Uh, with no disrespect to you and your question, that's something I've covered a lot in the last few lessons because people have had exams coming up for a while and I've given loads and loads of tips for what you should do uh, at the end of your exam preparation when the exams are near. So can I suggest that you go back and look at my maybe last three live lessons and see about the, have a look at the hints that I've given there. Um, but let's get on with the task for now if that's okay. Um, Again, no criticism of what's a really good question. I just want to keep pushing on. Right, write about a journey during which nothing particularly good or bad happens and which isn't even very boring, just normal. Describe it in a way that makes this ordinary experience as interesting as possible for the reader. So you see what I'm trying to do here? I don't want you to talk about being stopped by highwaymen. Um, I don't want you to talk about being so bored and describing boredom, because these are the kind of default modes that people tend to fall into when writing about things like journeys. They either um, do a sort of comic turn about boredom, or they come up with something really dramatic. And I want people, you here just to talk about the experience of travelling. A normal, something that's normal, but making it interesting. So, hmm, I'm on a journey what might be a really normal thing to do? Let's just go what's really normal. I'm sitting in the car, traveling along, and so I'm in the back seat, I'm looking out the window, and what might I be doing? What goes past? Lamp posts. Lamp posts. Let's write about lamp posts, because why not? Um, yeah. Do you sit down in the car and think, I'm going to look at lamp posts? No, you don't you kind of find yourself doing it. Rather than looking at lampposts, what would be a more interesting idea to develop? How about counting lampposts? Yeah, it is only, how long? How many, five minutes? Um, until I am counting lampposts. How's that? Okay, and we're straight into it. And again, what I'm trying to do here, as with pretty much all the examples previously, is add things that suggest things about character. I'm not saying that only one kind of character might count lampposts. I'm saying that it makes the reader start to think about this person's personality and think, hmm, that's interesting, they count lampposts. Are they, um, are they kind of obsessive? Um, or, um, um, you know, what is it? Are they someone like me or are they not? I, I want to find out. Um, Okay, but what? let's imagine that this person, because they haven't sat down in the car thinking I'm going to count lampposts, because that would be quite an eccentric um, journey plan. Let's imagine that they, um, they kind of find themselves doing it without realizing it. And then let's take that on a bit, and let's imagine they actually count for like, quite a long time before even becoming consciously aware, excuse me, itchy nose, that this is what they're doing. It's only five minutes until I'm counting lampposts, I have reached 36. Whoa, 30? I've reached 36 before I realize that I'm doing it. And now, we, now we're starting to think about the character of somebody who is either 
yeah, either sort of really obsessive about things, or on the other hand, someone, a kind of a bit of a dreamer, who just gets lost in things and just follows their imagination where it takes them without really needing to bring in, without always needing to bring in too much conscious thoughts about, thought about it. I don't know, maybe a bit of both. It's just interesting. It doesn't tell us what kind of person they are. It makes us imagine what kind of person they might be, though. And that is, I think, often the best way to set up character. Before I realise that I am doing it, um, and then what do they do? Do they go, oh, no, I'm counting lampposts? Or do they go, oh, I'm doing this. Why not? I'm just going to go with the latter, because that's kind of more interesting to me. It lets me keep exploring the idea. So, and by then, there's no reason to stop. Okay, and by then there's no reason to stop. Now let's try and get the reader interested in lampposts, because that's an interesting challenge here. I'm not really interested in lampposts. I'm going to try and interest myself by describing them a bit. What kind of post might there be? There might be metal posts. Metal posts. Um, pine posts. Let's say metal posts. Pine. What else might there be? What's an interesting kind of lamp post? Um, you know those ones that are done in a kind of old-fashioned style. They're a bit shorter and they've got kind of black metal posts and at the top they've got a kind of glass box that starts like this and then goes wider with a little kind of roof on the top in a kind of Victorian style, a kind of faux Victorian style. You might get them on some kind of new housing developments maybe. Metal posts, pine, um, um, and sometimes um, a, um, a little... Let's make it sound a bit old and sort of twisty, like it's got some twisty bits of metal on it and so on. A gnarled, and that makes you think of some kind of old twisted tree, doesn't it? A gnarled little Victorian? No, it's not Victorian, it's new. We want to show a sense of being, being, being a little bit out of place. Faux Victorian. So that means false Victor, pretending to be Victorian. A gnarled little faux Victorian thing with, yeah, with, the, with a glass, but with the light in a glass box. But we can, hang on, there's more we can do with this. In a, let's, because the reader might know exactly what I'm talking about, let's tape a glass box. So I've got a sense of it being narrow to wide. And that helps the reader to call it to mind, even if they haven't seen one of these recently. Metal posts, pine, and sometimes, hang on a sec, rather than and, what happens if I stick a semicolon? because that gives a longer pause as though I'm waiting for the next lamppost, which is a little sort of poetic trick of punctuation. Metal posts, pine. Sometimes a gnarled little faux Victorian thing with a light in a tapered glass box. Actually, I quite like the sound of that. A gnarled little faux Victorian thing with a light in a tapered glass box. It's a little bit fiddly to say with the light in a tapered glass box, but that to me makes this think, me think of this rather fiddly, very carefully constructed um, fake old fashioned lamp um, that maybe isn't as useful as some of the other, some of the more modern kinds that are taller and just cast down a bright, um, you know, bright um, um, harsh light. Yeah, it's only five minutes until I'm counting lampposts. I've reached 36 before I realised I'm doing it. And by then, there's no reason to stop. Middle post, pine. Sometimes a nardal faux Victorian thing with the light in a tapered glass box. I know what I can do at the end of this. So this person is still counting. So let's just show that. How can I show that I was still counting? Or why not do the counting? 42. Why have I not said 37? Because the last one was 36 because I want to show that all the time that I'm looking at the styles of lamppost and you know, telling the reader about them in this case, I've still instinctively in the back of my mind been checking them off. 37, 38, 39, 40, 41, 42. And that tells us even more about this character. And so on the face of it, I'm writing about lampposts. But what am I really doing? I'm writing about this character and their personality. And I've never actually said anything about their personality at all, but I've taken you into it. Um, um, there's a comment here that I absolutely love <laughs> uh, from Carol Knowles. It has only been 10 minutes and it feels like an hour. My dad is singing country songs. My older sister was snoring loudly. All this noise is making my head throb. And what I love about that comment, besides the fact that it's great writing, is that you could be talking about a journey in the car 
Or you could be talking about the experience of sitting through an easy 11 plus lesson with me with the same thing as in the background. It has only been 10 minutes and it feels like an hour. Well, here it's been 40 minutes and it probably feels like about two hours. Um, fantastic. Uh, okay. Super, let's move on. Uh, I'm not going to talk about too many more comments because um, I want to get on with going through some of these uh, illustrations. Um, okay. Because I want to show different ways of approaching things, the easy thing would just be to take a completely different scenario, like a train or something. I'm going to do another car one instead to show you some of the different things you might be able to do with a car. So there is somebody who's looking out the window. What about somebody who's really interested in driving and is really invested in the journey? Who might that be? How about a small child, someone much younger than you, someone for whom being in the car is a ima really imaginative experience? Um, I remember when I, I'm just, sorry, I'm just sort of riffing here, but I remember when I was a little child, I used to imagine that I was in the back of the car and I used to, there were this kind of, on the door, there were sort of vertical handles like that. And I used to hold onto that handle and I used to kind of grips. And I used to imagine that that grip was the joystick of a fighter aeroplane. And I'd imagine that I was flying this plane around, blowing things up. Um, and if uh, one of my parents would take a corner a little bit fast, um, I'd imagine that I was I was flying around in a great curve in some kind of great dogfight, and I'd pull on the joystick and make make you know rat -tat 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 noises and so on, um, and that was a really normal journey for me, and I really enjoyed it when I was a small child. Um, so uh, that's real that's a real memory for me. But now I'm going to turn that into something imaginative, um, something that didn't really happen to me. Um, I'm getting a bit low in the screen here, aren't I? I've got to admit the reason is because I've got my feet up on, a, on on top of a chair under the other side of the table, stretching out because it's been a long day. Um, anyway, it's working. I'm still managing to do the lesson while stretching out like a lazy thing. Um, so let's go with this. Sorry, I'm waffling on. Um, what does this child feel? They feel that they... I mean, let's imagine they're, they think they're driving the car because that's uh, you know, more focused connection with the actual driving. She imagines that she is that when she's obviously if you really asked her, she knows she isn't driving it, but in her imagination she imagines she is the driver. So let's get into her world of imagination. I'm not going to say I this time, I'm going to go in third person. The actual driver, oops, actual driver was always her. I like that because it isn't true obviously. But in her imagination, it is. So by making this statement, we are going into her imaginary world and treating that with respect as though it is real. Um, what's she doing? She's holding on to a, an imaginary steering wheel. She held, um, she held tight to, because I'm going to make her into a racing driver, because that's more fun than her just driving this normal car, normal car along. You know, she's going along, you know, she's sitting in the back of her, you know, um, not some really ordinary car. Yeah, what, how about she's in the back of a VW Polo. Sorry to VW Polo drivers, don't worry, it's not like I drive a fancy car. Um, I drive a 20-year-old Toyota Corolla, but anyway. Um, she held tight to, um, she held tight to the wide wheel, the wide invisible because we're playing on two things at once. It's not real, but for her it feels real. She held tight to the wide, invisible wheel. Where is it? She's a racing driver. It's up in front of her face like this. And so on. The wide, invisible wheel in front of her face. She felt held tight to the wide, invisible thing. What's she doing? It's she flying around corners. She's bracing herself against it, bracing herself. And I'm writing more quickly because I'm trying to get involved with her excitement, even if I make the odd mistake. Bracing herself as she, what does she do? She's in control. The car steers the corners quickly. She flings it round as she flung, flung the car around each corner. Um, how about now? She's driving precisely. She's a Formula One racing driver. And she flung the car through each corner because she's threading the needle. She's precise. She's a brilliant racing driver. She's, you know, she is Louisa Hamilton. And she flung the car through, through each corner. Um, and what would you feel? What would you experience as a racing driver? Um, you'd hear the screeching, um, the screeching of tyres, but let's bring some more senses in. The screeching and, and the smell. What's the smell? The smell of burning rubber? No, that's really conventional. The smell of cooked tyres. 
how about that? Screeching and screeching. Oops. And I see. I told you I'd write fast, but I'd, I'd make mistakes. But that's okay. I can sort them out. The screeching and the smell of cooked tires coming to her senses. No, it is, they aren't really coming to her senses because she's imagining it. Coming, but she can imagine these things coming to her senses alone. Okay. How's that for a story opening? The actual driver was always her. She held tight to the wide, invisible wheel in front of her face, bracing herself as she flung the car through each corner, the screeching and the smell of cooked tyres coming to her senses alone. I'll tell you what, people, that's my favourite one. That's the one out of these five that I'm most proud of, um, because I love this character. I love this little girl and her imaginative game. I see myself when I was young doing the same thing, and I can feel how much she believes this, how excited it makes her, even at the same time as she actually knows it's not real, but at the same time, she believes in it. And I, at the moment I'm writing about it, I believe in it too. Um, yeah, this is the one I'm proud of. And so I'm going to stop here. Um, I'm not going to do the third one for this exercise because I've been doing this for three quarters of an hour. That's plenty enough. You need to get away. As someone described the sense of, you know, 10 minutes feeling like an hour. So imagine what 45 minutes feel like. Let's call it a break at this point. Let's call it a day at this point. Um, yeah, I actually feel a bit excited writing that when you get really get into writing and it comes quickly and you're proud of what you've done okay um, if you can capture that feeling then you're doing really well it doesn't mean the writing's great but it means that I feel good about it and if I feel good about it that's a good start okay um, please don't put com song lyrics in the comments spam 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 Arr. okay let's move on Tip of the week for this week. Um, simple tip of the week, um, but I think it's really relevant. Someone in the comments just before this lesson started said something on the, along the lines of along, along the lines of there's going to be a whole load of new people this time, which is going to be true because there are quite a lot of people who've now finished their exams, but there are also people, particularly people starting year five, who are now thinking seriously for the first time about their preparation. And so I want to talk about that overlap between people who've done their exams and people who are starting their exams. And the fact that they are here together in the comments, watching these videos in the live comments now, in the comments under the video later, um, but also that you know people like that. You might have friends, you might have siblings, you've got people in the year above you at school and so on who've just done their 11 plus. And my tip of the week is something really simple, but I'm talking to both groups of people here. Um, You'll have all kinds of parents and tutors and people like me giving you loads of advice, but there are some people who really know what they're talking about and they are the people who have recently done their 11 plus exams. Talk to them, find out what it was like, get their tips, get their advice, um, talk to them about how they plan their practice, how much time they spent each day. Talk to them about the things that work, but also talk to them about the things that they did that they regret. Did they spend too much time doing timed papers? Did they get too lost in certain topics and neglect others? Did they spend too much time revising so actually by the time the exam came, exams came they couldn't concentrate? Or do they wish they'd revised a bit more? Are there other things that they can say to you? Benefit from that wisdom. Just because somebody is young doesn't mean they don't have wisdom to share. So people who've recently done their exams are a gold mine. Talk to them and learn. There are some wonderful YouTubers who um, are themselves young people who've done their 11 plus recently who have put their advice out there. Watch their videos and benefit from their advice. It doesn't mean they're right about everything anything more, any, more than it means I'm, any more than I'm right about everything. But think about what they have to say and consider whether it applies, applies to you. And if you are somebody who has just finished their exams or who finished them a while ago or who's about to finish their exams, think about what knowledge you might want to share with the next generation of people coming up to do theirs. Because that way you can, you know, give a bit back and that's a good thing to do in its own right. I could tell you how it benefits you, how it will help you to learn the right lessons and carry those forward, but just do it because it's a good thing to do. Because at the end of the day, there is no better reason for doing something. And that is my tip of the week. Right, let's move on to a few of... A few of your questions. Let's see what's going on here in the comments. I'm feeling really exhausted today, actually. I'm not quite sure why. There's no particular reason. Um, it's not like I've been, I haven't even, you know, gone and done any particular exercise today, which is very bad of me. Um, nonetheless, I feel really tired. So I'm not going to take too many questions, um, but let's deal with a few. Am I related to Robert Lewandowski? Uh, I am not. Um, uh, that's a notably different surname. That would be a Polish surname. Um, and Lomax is not. Um, Kofi Annim says that um, the stick insect, the female one, should be called Iris. That's a very nice name. I will certainly consider it. Um, 
Raja, by the way, I am girl. I am girl. Um, um, it's good to know. Um, also focus on speed. Okay, so that's someone sharing their advice. I mean, maybe they're right. As I've just said that people who've just done their exams have a lot of wisdom. I personally would be a little careful about focusing too much on speed without any disrespect to your comment and accepting that you have done this more recently than I have. Um, but I think that if you focus on speed too early, you just do things faster and faster and make the same mistakes faster and faster. I would generally advise people, people not to focus on speed until the exams are quite close. But I accept that that advice doesn't apply to everybody and I accept that you have a different opinion and it could be that you are the one who is right. Um, Funny Bunny passed their first test and is really happy. I'm very happy for you as well. Um, what books do you recommend reading? This is a classic question. Um, I wouldn't recommend a particular reading list. Um, I would recommend that you take the things that interest you anyway and then look for interesting ideas for books that follow those interests but that are not things you've already read. And one thing I often say because a really common question I get from students but also from parents is about reading how you can learn to read classic texts because more difficult slightly more fashion texts are often used in exams and they often teach you um, more advanced vocabulary and what I often say there is rather than just opening great expectations and expecting to enjoy it think about the things that read you in interest you sorry interest you that, read, that interest you in modern books so I often say, you know, maybe you like the Alex Ryder books, you're interested in spy stories. And then look for classic books about spies. And then you've got a good chance of actually being interested in them so that you're not just thinking, oh, this is old and boring. Um, and I often say in that context, you might want to look at some John, Buck John Buchan books, like The 39 Steps or something, or Green Mantle or whatever, which are to do with, you know, secrecy and spying and blah, blah, blah. And you might actually get into them. So that's a good way to do it. Um, help me. Saturday is my test. That's what I'm doing. I'm helping you. I'm talking about exam skills. Um, if your test is Saturday, it's probably a grammar school test. It's probably a first round test. It's probably more multiple choice. So have a look at some of my um, reasoning videos, my multiple choice videos for English. Um, check some core math skills of my videos that you might need reinforcing, that kind of thing. Um, can you two do, please do basic comprehension and basic creative writing along with MVR? I have got loads of basic comprehension videos on the channel. I mean, loads, as well as more advanced ones. There are already so many of them there. Uh, you can go to the Easy 11 Plus homepage by clicking on the, um, oh, beg your pardon, by clicking on my face with the blue circle around it going, um, in the next to the you know down underneath the video it takes to my channel homepage and if you go there you'll find loads of playlists for things like comprehension um, also I have a list of all my videos is it in the video description for this have a quick check um, ho ho yes in the video description if you look at it you see just underneath the link to the worksheet there's a place where it says all my videos in one list https go on slash go easy 11 plus.org slash video list if you click on that you get to a list of well it says it all my videos and then you can find the topics you need to cover such as basic comprehension and you'll find what you need. Uh, what secondary school did you go to Robert? I went to the King's School in Chester briefly and then I was at Christ Hospital down in Horsham for a longer, for a longer period of time. Um, um, so I'm good in maths but bad in English, what advice do you give me? If I said concentrate on your English skills that would be very obvious. Um, I, so therefore, although that's true, I'm going to say a couple of other things. Uh, number one, just because you're already good at maths, do not neglect your maths. It's easy to go, right, I need to work on my English, lose focus on your maths and find that by the time the exams come around, you've actually fallen behind in maths and you aren't at the front anymore. So just because you feel you need to work on your English, it doesn't mean you shouldn't keep working hard on your maths. Second thing is, hardly anyone is bad at English or bad at maths. When you really look at it, there are probably certain things that you struggle with. Try to identify what those things are as precisely as you can and then work on those precise skills. And then I think you'll find that your English in general improves a lot. Um, the stick bug can be named Stickney after the maiden name of Mars Moon Discoverer's wife. That's from Brittany. Lovely idea. We've got Iris, we've got Stickney. Um, can you do St Paul's exam walkthrough? If you mean St Paul's girls school, gun, girls school, I've done lots of videos. Uh, so, 
Okay, now I'm gonna get a plugin. Easy 11 Plus members, there are already some members only videos for uh, St. Paul's Girls School. Uh, and you can become an Easy 11 Plus channel member. Uh, there's a link in the video description, or if you're watching this on a computer, there's a big join button underneath the video. Join the channel and you will get loads of videos, um, especially for members, giving question by question walkthroughs of past papers from lots of schools. Um, and me showing exactly how I think about them, how I solve them, that includes the Paul's Girls School. There are also some, some Paul's Girls School videos in the main free part of the channel. Put St Paul's Easy 11 Plus into your YouTube search box and you will find them. Um, um, Aisha McKen, thank you Robin, my results came in and I'm selected for the second exam. It's all because of your help and I'll never forget you. That's a really lovely comment, thank you. And um, it makes me very happy indeed to read it. Um, I'm going to stop there, this has been long enough, we've been going for nearly an hour, that's long enough for anybody. And so, um, let's see if I can get um, Iris or Stickney out and, um, and her boyfriend and we will together say goodbye. So here we are. Oh, she's stabbing my hand. There is. Why don't we say that Iris is the girl and Stickney is the boy, and then we've covered, and then we've covered our bases. Um, how I'm going to tell Iris apart from the other ones that look pretty much exactly like her, um, and how particularly I'm going to tell Stickney apart, I'm not sure. But these names will serve. So from me and from Iris and from Stickney. Oh, there wasn't the logo on that. I need to sort that out. Um, it's been fantastic to have you here. Don't forget these live lessons are every Tuesday evening at six o'clock. Come along and please invite your friends and please like and please subscribe. And if you want even more of the benefits of Easy 11 Plus, investigate becoming a channel member. Click on join and read about the options. Just clicking join doesn't do anything. You don't get charged any money just for clicking join. It just shows you the options if you do choose to become a member. What do you think of that Iris? Iris says, join become a member. There we are. You've, can I make, make focus, focus on Iris? There we are. There's Iris and there's Stickney. So Iris says join. You'd be a fool not to. Fantastic to have you here. None of you are fools. Um, and it's been a real pleasure to have your fantastic comments. And I really look forward to seeing you at the same time next week. Bye bye. All right, Iris. All right, Stickney. I'm going to put you back in this little box here. And then I'm going to have to put you back in your tank afterwards. If I'm going to avoid getting stabbed and clawed and such like. Yeah, no, they're going, they're going. Don't worry, they're going. I know that, I know that my viewers are scary. But, you know, they try their best. They try.